Hello and welcome to the print soft cover. Uh, on the soft cover, we look at non-fiction books which are interesting, which make waves, and which are about a wide variety of topics. So for today, I have an interesting book again. Um, so this is a book uh, that actually made me think a lot. Because when we parenting, we talk about many things. In fact, the book of parenting is very popular. I think the moment people start thinking about being parents or wanting to be parents, they immediately Google, up to Google famous ho gaya, <laughs> pehle log bookshop mein jake So this is a book uh, called The Wisdom Rich uh, by Kamlesh Patel sir, uh, whom a lot of you may know, know as Daji, who's talking about and who's sharing his accumulated wisdom about parenting and what needs to change in parenting. Uh, first of all, sir, welcome to the print. Thank you for having me. Sir, uh, actually, my introduction to Shuru Karna Chati, why? Because I read it and I was, uh, that's where you talked about something fundamental that has happened to human civilization as a whole, uh, which is the COVID pandemic. And interestingly, that is also the time when a lot of people, you know, decided to get married, uh, you know, because, you know, there's <laughs> these uh, that's happening and people want to just like not lose out on time anymore. And a lot of people had babies, like from celebrities to common people, there were a lot of babies. But like COVID brought a lot of challenges for, you know, us, for everyday lives, you know, suddenly we all had to live together and be with each other constantly. It also brought a new set of challenges for to-be parents or parents who probably had not planned it that well because, you know, COVID hit and then they decided, okay, let's have a baby. So, sir, can you tell us more about that challenge? Because you talk about it, of course, in the book in detail, uh, about, you know, how difficult it became suddenly for parents. So, sir, could you please tell us more about it? Well, as you correctly said, a lot of people, they thought off uh, fast forwarding their life because you don't know how long they will live. Perhaps, you know, this is COVID and who knows next what may come. And they say, OK, I like to get married, like to have children. Uh, let's get together, be with parents and have a happy life together. Mm -hmm. See, That has triggered, uh, I would say it's a very good side benefit of having such a disastrous situation amongst us. Thankfully, we have passed. But I, you know what, I would like to share with you something that prompted me to write this book, mm -hmm. something that happened in 2012. Mm -hmm. One lovely girl like you who grew up in front of us, she was from Atlanta, and um, she was at that time 28 or so. Mm -hmm. I asked the beta, when are you getting married? You know, everybody, you know, especially when you're so close to someone. So she said, Uncle, I would get married when I'm 32, 33. Okay. Then somehow innocently I asked her, whom do you like the most in your family? She said, I love my grandmother. I said, why do you love your grandma so much? Then she gives all kinds of reasons. Then automatically one question flashed my mind and I asked her, would you, would your children have grandmother if you delay so much? Mm. She started thinking, say, I don't think so, uncle. So why are you depriving your children from grand, you know, grandparents altogether? And even if by chance, even if by good fortune or destiny, they still survive. They won't be able to chat. They won't be able to play. And something what we call transfer of wisdom or transfer of vibrations or transfer of personality, they cannot retain in their, in their mind. Because by the time they are 80 or 82, your child would be four or five years. And we hardly remember anything when we were of that age. We haven't even... We don't even recollect faces of people that we had seen at the age of four or five. And I was trying to convince her, you see, that if you delay so much, first of all, your grandchildren, I mean, your children will not have grandparents. And also, who knows, the way you delay and your child also delay, you too will miss out on your own grandchildren. So it's a chain reaction one, from one disaster to another disaster, if you may like to call it. Then another scientific reasons I put before her, 
is that, you know, when you get married at 32 and when you have children, maybe at 34, 35, mm -hmm. and when that child grows to be a uh, teenager, it, you will be about 47, 48. And, you know, teenage hormones, they bring havoc. They have their own uh, personality development. They get, they're adjusting with their new self. Right? Their mind works totally on a different uh, tangent. Mm -hmm. And you too, your hormones will also be kicking uh, kind of a chaos in your own uh, you know, body. You will be going through menopause. And no woman, no woman, I'd say, um, is comfortable during this phase of life. You are uncomfortable. Your children at the teenage period are also bringing havoc in the house. The whole house will be rocking. And whatsoever they demand, you'll say, okay, better, lele. And that is the period when you're supposed to regulate through right understanding, right arguments, your teenage brats. <laughs> Right. And you won't have that time. And then many other reasons I gave her was, one of them was also how female reproductive system and how chromosome transfer happens and how it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker as we age. And I said, why do you want to deprive them of your strong genes? You know, and now you are gifting them with the weaker gene. Why would you do such a thing? And uh, well, it went on and on and on. And to tell you the truth, she's still unmarried. Okay. Okay. Um, so this book, which is also a Penguin publication, and it is like it has nine sort of sections, which is talking about like individual ideas. So even before that, you have uh, said that you know that one of the things that parents tend to do, because we're also living in the kind of technology driven society, like I said, you know, it right at the outset, that we like to Google everything, you know, everything from, you know, direction to a place, to which medicine to take, to what to do. And that's why we all end up with cancer at some point, because we think, okay, whatever's happening to our body, ultimately the final cause is that. Like it's a common joke that runs to. Now parenting, and you used a wonderful phrase for it, they are doing it DIY style. Like, you know, parenting has become DIY. Uh, we are more nuclear families now. Like you also pointed out that, you know, most families don't live with grandparents anymore, or even uncles or, you know, aunts. We are all like singular units now. And that parenting, that's why has become more challenging. And especially if let's say both the parents work, um, you know, you have to involve like other kind of caretakers. But there's a point that I actually first want to focus on, which was very interesting. I felt like that you've, like even when you're talking about parenting, you're not just saying biological parents, immediate biological parents. You're also mentioning, like you also said, you know, grandparents could be aunts, yeah. could be siblings. That parenting is not simply the two people who are associated with the birding of the uh, child, but also these community. So it's like, tell us more about the community spirit of bringing up a child, because that I think is slowly going away. You said that it takes a village to sort of, we, we often say it takes a village to raise up, but the village is also shrinking in size, right? Like we live in tinier apartments now. Um, we live in, you know, nuclear family units. We have different kind of alternative, obviously communities now of neighbors and friends. But so tell us more about this, like the community, the, uh, the, how important the community is to bring up a child. Well, it is... Uh... It has a positive impact, tremendous positive impact. Um, whenever my children, I have two sons, and whenever they had some issues with me, <laughs> they would share with my business partners. You know, my father is thinking like this, and, uh, you know, his plan is like that. And then my partners would try to, you know, engage with them in a positive dialogue. And if they're still not convinced, they'll go to another another partner or another uncle and uh, try to make sense out of it. See, Technology has brought us together. You can Zoom, you can uh, do the FaceTime, you can Skype with your grandparents. Uh, as you say, it takes a village to raise a child. 
Likewise, in an apartment building, where there are 30 apartments, 10 apartments, or five apartments, it doesn't matter. You can have a cohesive relationship if we want to. Yeah. And we need to spend some time building a, a, a good community where children can grow safely. Like in my village, when I grew up, that, you know, in my village, when I was below 13, 14 years of age, I could go to any house, have discussion with the, the you know, owners of those places, have food there also. I did not even tell my parents that I'm here and eating food there. Uh, they would teach me also, let's say if I come straight from the school and enter someone's house, so they will ask me, what have you learned today? Can you can we help you with your homework, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And you know, there's just so much of spice in life. So many varieties of people are mingling with you in in a small village. Uh, not only that, they will joke around with you. They will share stories. They will sing bhajans or they will sing some classical music, and life becomes so enriching. But such is not the case also today. I mean, if you say my what about my village? Um, the quality of a village is totally gone also because everyone is busy with their own TV programs and as they say, Google programs, surfing online. Um, the life has moved away from a uh, village life or a community life oriented life to now individuality oriented life where you are in your jailed in your own house and within your own house your children have their own jail their bedroom and that is the worst thing people think that the enemies are outside you have to be careful when you walk on the streets for example if you're a girl and uh, at certain hours you may not even go out your parents may refuse that please don't go out after such and such time it's so dark and be please be careful but Providing these new technological weapons, mm. these new weapons are shooting them down in their own bedrooms because you have no control over where they are surfing. Mm. So in a, in a very invisible way, the enemies enter through these <laughs> wires. And uh, in that through that matrix only, you are being manipulated by so many other negative elements of the society. Of course, there is a positive also, but it is easier to fall prey to negative than to a positive. Hmm. Um, sir, uh, so again, coming back to where I started, which is the DIY style of parenting, right? And you said that prepare is the word. Like we are so, you know, we are, we are so, even parenting has become like, okay, you know, you're going to a war, you, uh, to a battle. <laughs> you have to have all your you know, weapons in place before you actually embark on this journey. And you basically, your suggestion is that it should be care over the idea of prepared, that there's, a, there's an element of nurturing. So that a child is not only developing, yes, he's not just ticking the boxes that you want in terms of maybe school and the competitions he's winning, but also in terms of holistically, spiritually, you know, in terms of this whole uh, wholesome sort of growth is required for the child, right? So, sir, tell us more about that because we notice now one of the problem is that, that, like, even if I compare, let's say, when I was growing up as a child, of course, we had also the pressure to perform uh, for marks and you know extracurricular. But now it has become a mandate. Like back then, it used to be an okay. You know, if, if somebody is doing more than studies, it used to be something that you would appreciate. But now it has become more like you have to do it. Like you have to have tuitions. You have to have at least one extracurricular activity that you do. Sometimes it's less about whether or not a child actually likes their activity. But it's more about there has to be one box that this child has to tick. Whatever it is. It's sports. It's arts. So, so what does that do? to? Because parenting is also about building a relationship with your child. right? Like It's not simply about, okay, you know, it's coming only from the end of the caretaker's. Whoever is getting the care also has to be a part of it, right? So do you think there's sort of like this, um, I don't know whether to call it miscommunication or whether to call it good intentions, but not working out. That's also happening, especially because like you said, you know, there, the, in, uh, the enemies are invisible now. You know, there is a huge uh, barrage of information technology coming in, not just for the parents, but also for children. Uh, so where does this relationship stand uh, in such a situation? It's extremely complex. 
extremely, I mean, it's so complex, you don't know where to begin also. And if you are trying to understand the evolving problem of somebody else, mm -hmm. and you're trying to answer, you'll be lost. Because you are not in their shoes. You are neither those parents nor your children whom you are trying to understand. When it comes to our own children and you are facing similar problems of, let us see, uh, hard work with towards the marks. And if you happen to like the uh, subject matter also, I think I would not, personally speaking, I would not force my child to say, okay, you got to do this, you got, no. I'll make it easier and more fun and more enjoyable, mm. that particular subject. Only then you are able to create a sort of a personality. Mm. Otherwise, it will be a crooked personality. You are forcing someone to do something against their wish. Right? When you are doing something against the will and wish of someone, it, you are forcing someone to do it. And now such smaller acts also prepares the personality of a child. And when you force them to do, they resent. Mm -hmm. And even when you are giving a right advice, good advice at the right time, they will resent even the good advice. Mm -hmm. So we have to go with the flow of what children like today. Mm -hmm. right? And if they are wrong, at least tell them, look, this is my feeling, but I am with you. Whatever you like, we'll proceed with that. Now, you were talking earlier in your question about preparing yourself as parents towards the children, right? Uh, most of the children born, born, I would say they're mainly accidental. Okay. Very rarely a couple says, okay, I'm go we are going to prepare ourselves. And what do they prepare with? Mother to be would start taking vitamins and minerals and start taking right food. If she was smoking or drinking, she would say, "Okay, no more of this, at least temporarily." And uh, they would try to adopt healthy habits, at least as a physical level. What remains out, what they deduct from this entire equation, is mental and spiritual component. That's a very um, interesting way of. Uh understanding this. So I'm actually coming to something that you've also said about discipline, uh, you know, and I think uh, that's that's something that stood out for me because I think I struggled with discipline a lot growing up, like this is the thing that I struggled. So tell us more about discipline because the uh, one, of, like, one way of looking at discipline is like when we used to think of school life and we said discipline the child, at, till a certain point of time it used to mean that if you spared a rod, the child is going to get this, you know, it's going to lose its way. You have to, no matter what happens, the discipline is external. Uh, usually a lot of people understand discipline is external. But you've also talked about self-discipline. And obviously you're saying that self-discipline is the one which keeps us on track. Because, okay, what happens when the teacher is not there and the rod is not there? You know, what if when the caretakers are not there? What about them? Because... Yes. Right. So, sir, tell us more about discipline because I think it's also very crucial in the kind of lives we live, you know, not just as children, but I think it's equally important because those children are going to be adults eventually. They are also going to become parents. So, how important is self discipline? It's very, very important. I, I often say that discipline should be there, but not at the cost of love. Don't break your child, don't crash him or her. And don't love your discipline so much that I am in love of discipline. No, that can break your relationship also. Mm -hmm. Discipline your love rather than disciplining, in, in, uh, rather than loving to discipline. Mm -hmm. Discipline your love. Often we say, okay, better you want this? Mommy, yes, I want that. And you give it. Then boy asks or a girl asks, mommy, I want this. And you keep on giving. This is not disciplining love from mother's side. Yeah. Another flip side of it is that you are so strict because you love the discipline. Precise time, you want the child to wake up. Precise time, you want them to go to sleep. That won't work. You have to, of course, there, there has to be a flexibility in all that, see. Uh, especially when a child is sleeping, 
try not to wake that child up because in that sleep, very special thing happens. We also, if someone wakes you up when you are in a deep sleep, what happens? We get so disturbed. Maybe some people get even a headache. So unnecessarily, don't keep on disturbing a child when they are at sleep. Discipline, of course, but not to the extent that the child starts hating you. I hate my mom. It's very common these days you hear such words. And it's because you're enforcing unnecessarily things to such an extent that child rebels. Now, when we talk of self, instead of external discipline by uncle, aunts, or papa, mama, if you train a child from the very beginning, self-discipline, we call it, and that is also a matter of how we train them. Training has to be from at the very beginning. You see, otherwise this what we call of neuroplasticity and neuro rigidity will kick in. Neuroplasticity means they are there and ready to accept whatever. Your mind is flexible enough. That's why they call it neuroplasticity. But when certain habits are rigidized, you become so fixated with your viewpoints and that does not let you become adjustable with the surrounding and that is not good in the business world today. Even if you want to be <clears throat> trying to uh, portray yourself as flexible, you may not be from inside, you may be rebelling, but you have to at least pretend that I'm flexible enough to listen to your viewpoints. At least that should be there. And then when you listen properly, that you might get the idea, okay, maybe what he's saying or she's saying is right. So parents, if they are not flexible towards the children, and study shows that children raised by parents who are so strict will also become so strict and rigid in their life. So you are actually grooming a personality of a devil. And rigidity means angry all the time. Because you, being rigid, you have your own strong viewpoints and you cannot get adjusted with others. So, sir, um, like I said that, you know, in an age when um, sometimes people don't want to go deep into knowing, sometimes you wonder, how do I become a better parent? Maybe I, I want to be prepared. Maybe I want to learn more about it, you know, beyond whatever is available. So, sir, where would you situate your book in that scenario for, let's say, the newer generation who are coming up? And people sometimes are also skeptical, like, you know, like you pointed out, like you shared the story of this person, you know, you asked her this pertinent question that, uh, you know, you had, you love your grandmother so much that your memory, you know, your memories with her are so significant for you. But, you know, what will happen when you have a child much later and that, that child might not get to be with her? Uh, you know, his or her grandparents. And uh, there is also like a lot of skepticism today about a lot of older wisdoms which have been passed down from generation to generation, which have been, let's say, up, used to be upheld as crucial, you know, so a lot of which are also in this book. So, so where would you situate this book when there is a lot of skepticism also in place about, let's say, traditions or wisdoms which have always existed? Well, uh... It is worth debating. Give me one example of debatable ancient wisdom that you don't like. So I unfortunately I am not, but I don't know. I in the top of my head, um, I don't know. Maybe uh, earlier, I think I think women would often not uh, work. Sometimes for a lot of people, women not going outside of their house and working outside would be like a big thing, maybe. I'm, I'm sort of like, that's the closest thing I could to come. At you know, Ms. Das, women have, have always been working more than men. You, we, we, we are highlighted. Women today, they are highlighted. Why? Because the, most of the work is outside offices. Hmm. Otherwise, from ancient times, Man, as you know, modern man, and he would what imagine a scenario. He comes from office, 
takes up a beer, clicks on the TV, watches a game. This is a typical scenario <clears throat> in the Western world, at least, uh, that I have seen. <clears throat> Women in Indian families in overseas countries, she goes to office, she goes to work, comes home, she has no time to even watch TV, she prepares food, does the dishes, puts children to sleep, then finally she goes to sleep. Okay. And before she goes to sleep, she throws all the clothes into the washing machine and she'll pick it up in the morning and then throw it for drying and by the time she comes back from office it's dried. She's always on the go. Mm. <clears throat> Earlier, even 100 years back, 200 years back, 1000 years back, women in India especially, they've always been busy, if not in the house, in the farms. If not in the farms, milking the cows and buffaloes. If nothing else, they'll be weaving clothes or weaving this har, the garland or something. They have always been busy. Man in a village, gossip around the circle. TV were not there. Yeah. Smoke beads together, hookahs together, gossip together. So when you talk of women, nothing much has changed. Nothing much at all as far as working environment. They are all they have always been working. What may have changed is just the dress. You are having lipsticks. They didn't have a lipstick. You are having a jacket. They had a sari. You have education. They didn't have education. You are polished. They are not polished. But fundamentally. Nothing much has changed. They have always been working. Uh, so would you say that then, um, this so-called skepticism, if, since we discussed this example, um, despite that, like this book is actually bringing them back into remembering that what you said, that fundamentally things have not changed. Fundamentally, that's why you see, I, I tell you, <clears throat> what you are trying to say, the ancient wisdom, right. since uh, we are not able to understand why of what we did or what we do. For example, if you were working in New York City, going to office, and being a married woman, you put perhaps tikka, mm -hmm. right? Kum kum, you'll put it on, on your forehead. And your colleagues may ask, Ms. Das, why are you having this red dot on your forehead? And it say, I'm married, but don't you have a ring? I say, yes, I do have a ring, but then why are you wearing it? And few times, different people question you, right? At different occasion. And then you get fed up of all the, get fed up. Oh, I don't like this question. People keep asking me, and then you stop doing it. Mm. It's okay. But in villages, innocent people, they are still doing it. You ask them, why are you doing it? They also don't have answers. But they take, they pride in themselves and say, I do it because of tradition. right? And I'm writing a book. My next one of my book would be, why we do what we do. There's a huge science behind it. See, there is also a science uh, or a traditional way that the day in-laws come to know that my bahu, my daughter-in-law is pregnant. They, they perform certain rituals and with a lot of respect, they send her back to her maika, to her parents' place. With a lot of rituals, a lot of prayers are offered for the welfare of the you know, mother and the child. Why? Why such festivity? Why such a prayerful thing in sending off your daughter-in-law who is conceived. There is also a science, as I was saying, it's all about epigenetics. And I have mentioned that in detail, and uh, that how mother-to-be in a peaceful environment is able to give the neurotransmitters, release the neurotransmitters, which calms the baby and calms yourself also. And with such environment, 
where good hormones are kicked in, good neurotransmitters are kicked in. Your frontal cortex remains very healthy, means your cognitive ability later on becomes very rich. Otherwise, when you are in a stressful situation, when you are pregnant and your husband always demands, you know, this thing or that thing, and, and you are always stressed out. What happens then? It's a symptomatic response and you're always in a fight or flight situation where your blood rushes into your arms. And when blood rushes into your arms, it is at a cost of, you know, it is diverted from other organs, mm -hmm. which are visceral and more important organs like liver, lungs, the frontal part. And it goes into the back part of the brain. It goes into the, and that little child, little embryo had nothing to do with your fight in the house. So with that wisdom, the our elders, they sent Bahu back to her, you know, more comfortable, more familiar place where she will find a relaxing atmosphere. They will have kathas, you have kirtans, you will have bhajan, you will have stories, you will have so many things going on at the same time. And there are many such uh, traditions. And if you do come across a questionable tradition that doesn't convince your heart, please write to me because that question can become part of our next book. So this has been a very fascinating conversation. And I wish I actually didn't have to <laughs> stop, but unfortunately, there's a time for that we have been... It's okay, man. It's okay. <laughs> Um, thank but thank you, sir. This is actually uh, looking at, I mean, like I said, constantly reading through the book, you know, there are a lot of moments where I was thinking about, okay, I've not thought of this in this manner. <laughs> Especially, like I said, about the discipline bit when I was reading, it was something close to me. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you for talking to me. Um, and this has been wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. And if you ever pass by Hyderabad, do come to our ashram. You will really so. enjoy it. I've not been to Hyderabad ever, so this is actually such a wonderful <laughs> opportunity for me, actually. So, but yes, I'll definitely I'll do that. Please come. Thank you. Thank Namaste. you, sir. Namaste, sir.